pressing on the open way. Tonight, let's look at Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. Now, this is about Moses setting up the tabernacle in the Old Testament, that little tent thing that God told him to build in the wilderness. And chapter 40, he puts it all together and. Uh, but you know, we are the temple of God in this age. And there's a lot of things we can learn from this temple about us, which is the New Testament temple. So we're going to look at that tonight and look at a couple things that we can make parallels to. Uh, we're going to look at verse 34. Exodus 40, 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Heavenly Father, help us now as we look to uh, the Old Testament and we look at the New Testament and find the parallels there are between us and uh, this little great tent in the wilderness. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, Now uh, hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And ten verses later he says, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now how come you quote those two verses because I want you to see that uh, everything uh, God deals with he sets it up and he sets it up according to a plan and even though we're not a literal tent uh, we do have to follow God's plan now of course we know that uh, when Paul came along uh, God's plan sort of changed mainly because the Jews rejected the Messiah again in the book of Acts and toward the end of the book of Acts uh, basically God um, turned to the Gentiles for the next 2,000 years 
And uh, they will receive Christ as their Savior uh, right before the second coming of the Lord during the tribulation. But that's still a ways off. Uh, but I want you to notice something here. Of their verse 34. Uh, notice the cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord uh, filled the tabernacle. Oh, look at the next verse. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Um, I want you to see that this little gray tent is cloud covered. Now, you say, what in the world does that have to do with a Christian? Well, we're covered. Amen? We're just not covered with a cloud. We're covered in the blood. Amen? Um, Leviticus 8.15 talks about uh, Moses and this uh, blood covering that, that had to do with this tabernacle. Um, it says in uh, Leviticus 8.15... And he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it on the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it and to make reconciliation thereupon. Um, look, God deals with the blood. And, and, of course, this is just one verse out of a whole bunch of them. Uh, God sprinkled the whole thing with oil and the blood and and sanctified this thing in the Old Testament way. When we get saved, we get washed in the blood, and the Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells in us. And we're covered with God inside anyway. Our flesh isn't. I mean, we have to control it. Um, but uh, like the tabernacle of old, the reason Moses did all this stuff, well, it was because they wanted God to have glory. And that was the way to have glory was to uh, follow God's instructions. Uh, even in the Old Testament, it was still about God's glory. Leviticus 10.3, uh, And Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people will I be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. So God says, look, as long as you're using this whole thing and everybody comes here, you're going to do it because you're going to glorify me. I'm going to wash away your sins. I'm going to put you in a place where you can serve me. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this. He says, I learned when I was a boy that the chief end of man was to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, he said that's what he learned when he was a, a boy coming up in church. Now, this is a... This is at the end of the 1800s now. He says, Now I hear according to the new theology, and that's about when it came along, that the chief end of God is to glorify man and enjoy him forever. This is a turning of things upside down. And that's what happened to the Bible. That's what happened to the churches. They decided, well, it's not all for God's glory. Uh, I, God's doing it for man's glory so he can... Look, uh, the fact that we get to go to heaven and enjoy God is kind of a uh, just just a side benefit of what God's plan is. We, we're, we're lucky enough to live at the right time at the right place and believe the right thing to get in on it. Um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, people had to cooperate and the processes that God had to enjoy God's blessings. Now, in the New Testament, we have to cooperate with the plan of salvation. If we don't, we're not going to go to heaven. And even as a Christian, we have to please God and cooperate in his will for our life. Um, 2 Timothy 2.21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So God, he said, look, uh, God wants you to get rid of all the things that you need to get rid of. And if you do that, he can take and he can come down and he can use you to do something. And you're going to be happy with it. God's going to be happy with it. Everybody's going to be happy with it. Except people who hate God. Um, 1 Timothy 4, 5 says... For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. 
Now, of course, that's all about eating, but I'd say anything is sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. That's why I get in the car and I pray for it. I start, start off down the road. Uh, that's why I sit at my desk every morning and I pray. And I read my Bible before starting the day. I want God to bless that day. I want God to take care of me. And I know to do that, I've got to involve prayer and the Word of God. Uh, notice that this... Um, Tent was uh, covered, and it uh, not only was it uh, uh, covered uh, with with uh, this cloud, but it was clover, covered with the glory of God and filled with the glory of God. Um, we should want to be filled with the glory of God. Amen. Um, our sins do need covering. Um, you know, we can people will say, "Well, you know, I I don't do as bad as that fellow over there." Uh, God's not going to judge you according to some fellow over there. When you get to whatever judgment we're going to, whether it's a lost person at the uh, white throne judgment or us at the judgment seat of Christ, it's just going to be uh, you and him. You and him. You and me, him and me. Uh, not, not me and you and him and a bunch of other folks. Uh, Romans 4 uh, makes this very plain. Uh, verse 7 and 8 says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We need our sins taken care of. I don't care who we are. We need, we need for them to go by the hill called Calvary. Uh, I like the old song. We don't sing it nearly enough. There is a green hill far, far away without the city wall. Where our dear Lord was crucified, he died to save us all. We may not know and we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us. He hung and suffered there. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. There is none other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only uh, could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Oh, dearly, dearly, he loved us, and we must love him too and trust in his redeeming blood and try his works to do. That little song was written by uh, a lady who was married to Cecil Alexander, Miss Alexander. Uh, she uh, was a preacher's wife. She also was a, a Sunday school teacher. And back in those days... Um, they taught a lot of uh, church uh, church things. Of one class she had was on the Apostles' Creed, um, which said, "Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried." And she was teaching on that part of the creed, and uh, she uh, intended for her children um, to uh, learn this lesson. And she wrote this little song for them. Well, the adults heard the kids singing it couple times and they kind of liked this song and they said well we want to sing it too so they kind of imported it to the main church and uh the husband was all for it he thought it was a great song um her husband once wrote this of her says uh, from one poor home to another she went christ was ever with her and all felt her great influence those who knew her intimately claimed that her life was more beautiful than her hymns and poetry. She was a very humble woman who disdained praise for her accomplishments. However, the account is given on one occasion that when someone wrote to tell her of the change in life and heart that had come to a worldly man through the influence of one of her hymns, uh, as it was sung, Miss Alexander sprang to her feet and joyfully exclaimed, Thank God, I do like to hear that. So God will use you no matter who you are. And he can do great things. Uh, the second coming in the Bible uh, foretells of God's glory covering everything. One day, all the badness will be gone and God, God's goodness will cover everything. I, I hope that day comes soon. Uh, Habakkuk 3.3 talks about this. It says, God came from Teman. Uh, Teman is in Edom. He said, well, God didn't come from Teman. Yeah, but he will during the second advent, which is what this verse is about. And the Holy One from Mount Paran, uh, Salah, uh, that's where the Jews are going to 
uh, Sela Petra, um, down there where the Jews are going to hide from the Antichrist, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. So that's a direct prophecy of the second coming. And once he comes and delivers the Jews and uh, saves the tribulation saints, he's going to set up his kingdom and everybody's going to praise him. They're going to be real happy. Uh, one of these days we'll come be complete in our covering. Right now our flesh is not covered, but it will be soon. It will be one day. Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments and as the bridegroom adorneth herself with jewels. Well, one of these days we're going to be the bridegroom. We're just going to be adorned in the book of Revelation. As we're going to sashay out there to the, the marriage of the Lamb. Revelation fifteen eighteen and the temple was filled with the smoke of the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. That's the that's the temple up in heaven. Just just to show you that even up in heaven they have this problem where things get so full of God they, they can't do much with with the temple thing. Um, so it was cloud covered, it was full of God, and the congregation's tent was sanctified to the Lord. Now, this little gray tent in the wilderness, uh, in Exodus 29, 43, it says, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Leviticus 8.10, and Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. So you see that we must be sanctified. We must be set apart if we're going to be any good to God and bring any glory to him. Psalm 4.3, uh, but I know that the Lord has set apart, see that's what sanctify means, him that is godly for himself, the Lord will hear when I call unto him. You want God to hear your prayers? Well, get sanctified. God will hear them. Revelation 3, 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not, not denied my name. That's talking about the church of Philadelphia. Uh, we're in the age of Laodicea, but there are still a few churches of Philadelphia around. I hope Wars is one of them. Uh, I can always hope. Uh, a certain uh, prophet thought to render God a special service. And to do this, he believed it necessary to journey to Mount Sinai, for there he might hear God's voice and learn the secret of holiness. Uh, after a long toil, he reached the mountain and waited in vain for the special vision of God. One day he found a bed of moss and violets. Then he remembered at home, his little child had brought home something from out of the garden around the house, some moss and violets, and wanted to give it to him, but he was too busy getting ready to go to Mount Sinai. And he thought about this, and God kind of touched his heart that he could have stayed home and got the same blessing. <laughs> then he did it on Mount Sinai. Well, you see, it, it don't matter... Where you are, it matters uh, who you're connected with and who, who you're fellowshipping with. Amen? God does expect us to do our best, even even though we're saved. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In conclusion... The Bible says some more things about the temple of God in this age. And there's a dire warning about our temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So, 
even though we're not a little great tent in the wilderness, and this is just a church where people meet, and it's just a building, and there's nothing holy, uh, particularly about our walls and our ceiling and stuff. Uh, we are a different story. God wants us to be his holy temple, and that means we have to make this thing behave here, and what's inside, we need to make sure it's dedicated every day to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can please him. Heavenly Father, help us as we uh, say our prayers and go our ways. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you that uh, uh, folks is uh, uh, out of town. I, I pray that they got there safe and they're feeling better. I pray you help our Uncle Charlie tomorrow. He's having surgery. And I pray you be with him. Um, he said he probably wouldn't be here tonight. He's getting to bed early so he can get up and get out to the doctors and uh, have this surgery. Um, so I pray you be with him and his wife and his family uh, while this is going on. And Lord, uh, help us Sunday as we come back and, and have a, a worship service. And I pray you that the rest of this week will, uh, God, be filled with your glory and please you with what we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is there anything we need to bring to the Lord in prayer this week?